Bonjour à tous, KTO fête son 15e anniversaire et à cette occasion, la rédaction vous propose une série de grands entretiens pour aborder les enjeux actuels de l'Église. Nous parlons aujourd'hui de l'évangélisation en Asie, ce vaste continent où vit 60% de la population mondiale et où 3% seulement sont catholiques. Et encore, si on retire les Philippines, le ratio tombe à moins de 1,5%. C'est dire l'ampleur de la mission de l'Église. Alors l'Asie sera-t-elle le continent du troisième millénaire, comme l'avait dit Jean-Paul II, quelle contribution l'Église peut-elle offrir à ce vaste continent et quel témoignage de foi les Asiatiques apportent-ils au monde Nous en parlons avec le cardinal Luis Antonio Tagli. On est heureux de vous retrouver, Éminence. Bonjour. 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 Vous êtes archevêque de Mani depuis 2011, créé cardinal par le pape Benoît XVI en 2012. Vous êtes théologien, vous avez 57 ans. Vous êtes, ça vous fait sourire, une personnalité incontournable parmi les évêques d'Asie, également parmi le collège des des cardinaux. Et vous avez ce surnom qui est, j'allais dire, beaucoup moins protocolaire de Chito. Pourquoi D'où est-ce que ça vient Mon nom réel est Luis. C'est un nom spanish. Vous appelez les enfants Luisito. Luisito, diminutif. Et donc Chito est un petit Luis. C'est pour cela, donc, bon, on ne va pas vous appeler forcément Chito, mais en tout cas, c'est comme ça que vous habitez le cœur des, des Philippins. Les Philippines, justement, attendent la venue du pape François du 15 au 19 janvier. C'est un grand événement, évidemment, pour le pays. Les Philippines, c'est un pays où il y a 80% de catholiques. Est-ce qu'on n'idéalise pas un peu les, ce pays, au fond, quand on le représente comme un modèle en Asie Oui, Philippines, we uh, take pride in saying that uh, we are one of the two Asian countries with the biggest Christian population. But having said that, we also admit that uh, not everything is uh, well and perfect in, uh, in our country. We thank God for the gift of faith and the religiosity of the simple people and the poor people is really amazing. We pastors, we learn a lot from them. I see how the faith of people gives them hope in the midst of many problems, in the midst of, uh, of uh, uh, poverty, injustice, and even natural calamities. But I tell you, just like any people in the world, we try, we don't always succeed, but we try to live according to our faith. It is for us a big source of concern. I am worried when we say we have the most number of Christians in the Philippines, yet we find some of the poorest people in Asia in the Philippines. We also see a lot of uh, inconsistencies in living the faith. Uh, corruption, for example, in government, unjust structures, yes. We are happy to have the faith as our strength, but we also know we have a long way to go in, uh, in uh, fully living the faith, especially in society. C'est pas seulement donc une question de nombre, uh, la qualité de, de la foi. The quality of faith, as you said, no? uh, this happens on different levels. No? On the level of uh, the profession of faith, I think, we have no problem, you know. People will declare publicly, we believe in God. If you have been to the Philippines, mm -hmm. you take the, uh, the metro, you take the bus, you take the jeepney, you see religious objects everywhere, you know. The crucifix, you have the Madonna. So people are not ashamed to proclaim the faith. Ils aiment ça, ça fait partie de la culture même. Oui, yes, yes, it's, it has entered also the, uh, the, the psyche, it has entered the culture. Uh, many of our cultural events are also religious, like our processions, our devotions to Our Lady, all the festivals that have defined the culture are also always religious. The, the churches are full. Sunday masses and uh, the villages all. So in terms of proclaiming the faith and uh, showing that we are Christians, we have no 
problem with that. Alors, I think, pourquoi êtes-vous inquiet? Um, but I, I think the, the big uh, concern, which was already mentioned by the bishops of the Philippines in 1991, is the uh, separation between the faith that is professed and daily life. The influence of the faith in, uh, for example, in my relationships, in my use of uh, money, in my way of dealing with other people. For example, in the world of business, in the world of politics, does the faith really uh, play a big role so that my actions, my decisions, and the structures, the policies that we implement really uh, are in accordance with our faith. Il ne faut pas oublier d'ailleurs qu'aux Philippines, l'Église a accompagné la démocratie, a accompagné la liberté avec cette grande figure du cardinal, du cardinal Sin, Sin, qui yes, a lutté yes. contre la dictature. Oui, et nous sommes reconnaissants que nous avons des gens comme le cardinal Sin, nous avons beaucoup de leaders religieux qui apportent l'énergie de la foi dans la transformation sociale. But we also realize that it cannot happen like in one big event. Like, uh, okay, in 1986, the dictatorship ended. But with the change of precedence, it doesn't mean that the whole system will change. Même si les présidentes, la présidente était catholique, celle oui, qui a suivi. Oui, yes. and um, uh, after after uh, uh, President Marcos, uh, all the presidents are Catholic except one, who is, but he is a Christian, uh, a Protestant, you know. And so we realize that true freedom cannot be achieved in one week, you know. After that glorious days of we call a people power, the bloodless revolution, we realize we need to work for true freedom, the true dignity of human beings daily, daily. So now, after so many years, we're still working at it. Yes. Eminence, qu qu'est-ce qu que cela révèle de l'évangélisation en Asie, qui prend beaucoup de temps, qui prend peut-être même des générations When we're talking of Asia, we're talking not of one world. <laughs> yes, it is one continent, but really there are many, many Asias. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. And uh, the, the, the history of evangelization in Asia also uh, is quite diverse. Some churches in Asia, for example, in uh, South Asia, India you know, uh, particularly, they claim Uh, evangelization from apostolic times. Saint Thomas, Saint Bartholomew. In parts of China, Christians arrived as early as the seventh century, the Nestorians, and the rest of Asia, you know, uh, during the 16th century or the 15th century. So there are different stages in the evangelization of Asia. Now, When you're talking about the different levels of evangelization, that is quite uh, tricky. Pourquoi? <laughs> How do you measure? How do you measure levels? How do you measure depth? How do you measure whether something is, is, is deep or, prof or, or, or superficial? I know in some parts of the world, for example, here in Europe, you know, One indication of the success of evangelization is numbers. If there is a big, big Christian population, then we say, ah, oh, evangelization has been successful. Donc c'est un critère que vous contestez en vous écoutant. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In Asia, in many parts of Asia, the number remains small, but You see people who are committed to the faith and who are willing to die for the faith. Les martyrs. Les martyrs. Yeah. And then we have also those who, are mar who experience martyrdom on a daily basis, you know, quietly, 
you know, they may not be seen by the world, they may not be counted in the numbers, but they, they are firm believers and they are willing to lay their lives down. Comment cela configure le visage de l'Église ou des Églises en Asie, ce martyr Yeah, you know, uh, when you go to, to uh, we were in Korea, oui, nous étions ensemble. <laughs> yes, uh, the beatification there. Oui. Oh, yeah. Thousands, huh? thousands of martyrs, and many of them without names. And they will never be named, but their blood is the, 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 the water no? that makes the seeds of faith of every generation to grow. The same in Vietnam. And I know many more that we do not recognize in many parts of Asia. So uh, for me, the presence of the martyrs, known and unknown, is already a testament to the, 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 the depth, the profound level of evangelization. But uh, at the end, I want to share with you uh, uh, also, uh, as I said earlier, we have wonderful people whose faith is very deep. I, I am a witness to that. You know, Timor Leste, you know, having gone through a very serious war, you know, what keeps them alive? You know, is there, is there hope in their, the nurtured by faith? In the Philippines, we have typhoons, we have poverty, we have a, a lot of um, dreams unfulfilled, but it's the faith that, uh, that makes people rise up and, and go. Some people ask me, how come uh, uh, Christianity did not spread in, uh, in, in many years? It's a vrai question. It's just, it's really, no? question. Yeah. You know, that is a, 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 good, uh, a good question. Uh, do you have an answer? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I've read some um, studies right. on this. And one interesting study done by a European uh, says that if you look at Asia, you do not find a king, a queen, a sultan, that was converted to Christianity. And he says, this, this uh, scholar said, now maybe because no king or emperor in, in Asia became converted, Christianity was not imposed on the people by a ruler. So instead of a king or an emperor commanding the population. This is the religion that you must embrace. It is the quiet work of missionaries, of individual Christians that spread Christianity. Quand vous It's racontez so... ça, Eminence, ça me fait penser au, au baptême du prince Vladimir, au ah, baptême de Clovis, Clovis effectivement. Constantin. Eh oui, Constantin. Et alors, et vous, vu d'Asie, comment vous regardez ça Well, we just have to accept the fact that uh, no ruler was uh, converted, you know. Uh, and uh, maybe in the Philippines, it happened a bit. We, have, uh, we had, during that time when the Spaniards came, there were local rulers. The, they called them the Datus. No? And where the Datu got converted, everyone followed. And maybe that was the reason why in the Philippines uh, Christianity spread. You convert the leader, the political leader, and everyone would follow. C'est un petit peu le cas en Inde, Eminence, hein, dans certains, certaines régions, euh, dans le nord de l'Inde notamment, où des villages entiers deviennent chrétiens. Euh, en ce moment, ces dernières décennies, c'est un travail que font des, des Indiens missionnaires. Vous dites-vous que ce n'est finalement pas le modèle d'évangélisation en Asie Ce n'est pas celui qui s'est produit Vous savez, une contribution, probablement, que nous pouvions donner, c'est un modèle d'évangélisation, c'est vraiment que nous allons revenir à la base, personne à personne. Éminence, ça touche aussi à la question de, 
l'identité et du rapport à la culture. Mmh. Euh, le pape François, euh, aux évêques oui, euh, d'Asie, en Corée, l'a rappelé. Mmh. Euh, il n'y a pas d'identité claire sans dialogue. Et pour qu'il y ait mission, il y ait dialogue. Et donc, ça renvoie à l'identité. Mmh. Mais la question d'identité en Asie, elle n'est pas simple, l'identité chrétienne. Hein. Mmh. Euh, je, je pense à un exemple en particulier. Euh, mmh. Au Cambodge, on dit euh, les Cambodgiens sont bouddhistes. Mmh. Si tu n'es pas bouddhiste, tu n'es pas cambodgien. Mmh. Alors, que sont les chrétiens au Cambodge oh. <rire> Well, uh, when we are talking about Christian identity, uh, it is something that is not, uh, uh, it is not an object of a definition. But for Christian identity, wherever, it is basically following Jesus, being a disciple of Christ. Now, when the Pope talked about identity and dialogue, uh, You cannot dialogue without knowing who you are. In the Christian identity, following Christ, being a follower of Christ, means that I know who I am, but the identity of a Christian is always open to others. So it is an identity that you do not preserve by closing yourself. No? To others. It is an identity that is always open to receive the others and to go out to others. Now that is very tricky. That is very difficult. But that's why you see when you go to Europe, Christian identity is, uh, for example, uh, if you go in, in France, you no, know, you recognize, yes, these are Christians, but they are Christians in a French way. You no. Know? But when you go to Cambodia, you know they are Christians, but they express their Christianity in a Cambodian way. Uh, Pope Paul VI, when he went to Uganda, and when he went also to, uh, to India, and later on to the Philippines, he encouraged the Christians, be Christians, but do not lose your being African. Yeah. You be Christians, but Christians in an Indian way or a Filipino way. Donc la foi chrétienne n'est pas un danger pour les cultures. Parce que parfois, dans les pays, on peut concevoir et on perçoit les chrétiens comme un danger ou la foi chrétienne comme une agression extérieure. In Asia, maybe this is one reason why some parts have not accepted Christianity. Because Christianity came, especially in the 16th century, bearing the clothing or the, the language of Europe. Yeah. And, and so uh, a people that doesn't want to be conquered by Europeans thought that one tool of conquest was the Christian faith. No. But now we are discovering through inter-religious dialogue that uh, the Christian faith could acquire an Asian, an Asian uh, face, an Asian form. And I'm very happy that uh, uh, there is growing interest in this dialogue between Christianity and Asian cultures in order to find ways of expressing The deep truths of Christianity. C'est une source de richesse. Of wealth. Wealth also for humanity. You know? Wealth also of wisdom for understanding the, for example, some, some mysteries of life, suffering and death. You know? The Christian faith centered on the crucified Christ who rose from the dead can be a source of, 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 uh, of uh, a lot of wisdom you know, to peoples of, uh, of Asia who are suffering and who want to make sense of such suffering. Eminence, euh, il y en a quand même qui ont peur de la foi chrétienne. Ce sont euh, parfois des pouvoirs, des idéologies, hein, basé, des pouvoirs basés sur des idéologies qui sont contraires à la foi chrétienne. Est-ce qu'ils ont raison d'avoir peur Je pense euh, à la Chine, euh, mm -hmm. au Vietnam, pourquoi pas au Laos, qui sont encore des mm -hmm. pays où la liberté religieuse n'est pas pleinement mm -hmm. mise en œuvre. Oui. Uh, I, uh, I would like to, uh, to answer that on two levels. First of all, the message of the gospel is always disturbing, not only to... Uh, 
uh, governments, but even to us. I am already, I've been baptized since, since uh, 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 birth, and uh, whenever I hear the Word of God, I, I'm also threatened, you know? Uh, there are many things that the Word of God mm, challenges in us. And imagine uh, governments and people with power listening to the Word of Christ. Oh, they will also feel that. So the, the gospel has uh, within it uh, some challenges you know, that could disturb people. But the second thing is what I already said. Many people or, or governments in Asia think that the, the church, which is the bearer of uh, the gospel, is some sort of a supranational power. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, that could uh, be uh, uh, a threat to uh, local governments, you know, uh, and and they say it's a, uh, and some fear that uh, the Pope is is something like that, a, a super super power that could uh, command. The, the, it's not true. No, it's not true. It is a, it is it is not the power of domination, but it is the power to serve, and to uh, in fact work for human dignity and work for the common good. Pour autant, euh, et vous l'avez dit lorsque vous avez été créé euh, cardinal, l'Église doit faire son examen de conscience sans cesse, l'épiscopat en Asie. Being a, a, a minority a church in, a, in Asia, uh, the, the eyes of people are always on us. And we always have to, to, uh, to consider How do people perceive the Christian faith through us? And so that would require not only individual uh, examination of conscience and renewal, but also collective, collective as an institution. And so, for example, in, uh, in uh, the past uh, 20 years of the existence of the uh, Asian uh, Federation of Asian Bishops Conferences, you know, almost 40 years now of existence. But these past years of reflection, you could see it was an, it's a never-ending examination of conscience. How is the church contributing to the common good? How is the church contributing to peace? Is there anything in us that we should change so that the face of Christ, the face of Christ could be seen more clearly by peoples of Asia. Et peut-être un dernier mot, et un peu comme un, un cadeau en quelque sorte pour ce 15e anniversaire. Euh, quelle est votre espérance à vous, euh, et peut-être que vous éprouvez personnellement à travers votre cheminement euh, de chrétien, euh, puisque vous appelez les chrétiens à être des missionnaires, vous l'avez éprouvé vous-même I, I, I should say, when uh, we are like I, I speak for myself, not just for, for the peoples of, of the Philippines or of Asia, but I speak for myself. Uh, when you uh, go through life, you know, and uh, of course you have some goals, you have some dreams, you know, every, every person you know, uh, is, uh, wants to, to, to reach uh, a, a goal. And especially in Asia, Young people are driven by the family, by the parents, to cas? work hard. C'était votre cas? Uh, well, yes, because I saw how my, my parents also came from very simple backgrounds and poor, not really very, very poor, but, you know, we, we were not rich, you no, know, and, and so, and so they, they want to make life better for their, for their children, etc. So the desire to work hard, etc. is there. But somewhere along the line, I realized that the best gift that my family has given to me is not so much studies, not so much my academic uh, uh, fervor, not so much the ambitions or dreams, but it is the faith. The faith that makes us good human beings, the faith that makes us face the difficulties of life, the faith that 
binds us together. Right now, you know, my parents are in the Philippines, both of them 84 years old. You know? I am a bishop, I'm a priest, so I, I go everywhere. My brother is living in the States. Yeah. Very rarely do we see each other together. But what binds us together, aside from the cell phone, aside from uh, the internet, it is the faith. No, when you know you are praying for one another, when you know that we are a family not only because of blood, but because of our, of our Lord, then there is joy, there is hope. Avec Jésus. Avec Jésus. Oui. Un grand merci, Éminence, de nous avoir accordé cet entretien. Et bien sûr, on va vous retrouver au cours de ce voyage du pape François aux Philippines, donc en, en janvier prochain. Merci beaucoup d'avoir suivi cet entretien. Merci pour votre fidélité. Et bien sûr, vous pouvez retrouver le cardinal Taglé sur Internet, sur le site Internet de KTO. À très bientôt.